Hello, hello. <laughs> Shit that I've learned session. So, I'm just going to tell you a little bit of a personal story of mine. I'm climbing on Mount Everest. This was 1998. Have you ever had a dream? A dream so vivid, so real, and so powerful that you thought you actually had experienced it. When I was 16, I was reading about Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay's account of summoning Mount Everest, May 29th, 1953. When I put that book down, that's when I first dreamt, I first visualized that one day I would climb Mount Everest. What do you think it took to move that dream to a goal and then to reality? Well, it was commitment. But it's not commitment in any form of an obligation. Oh no. Most importantly, it's the toughest commitment of all. It's a commitment to yourself because you want it and you believe in it. You know, to some people, Mount Everest is the ultimate symbol of challenge, achievement, and dedication, both mentally and physically, in that it's a universally accepted euphemism for some pinnacle of success. Well, to me, all goals are important. And the importance of the goal is in the eye of the goal setter and the one who commits to it. Every personal and professional goal we seek out doesn't come without its own inherent challenges and risks. But that's what makes it worthwhile. That's what certainly would get my juices flowing and get me up in the morning. That inner challenge to succeed. It doesn't matter what talent or skills you have or you don't have. What matters is what you believe inside and how badly you want to achieve it. So here I am, going for my summit attempt, 1998, and I'm with the British Expedition, and we're up at the South Summit, the second highest point on Earth, 270 vertical feet below the summit of Everest. We arrive there. And there was a, a, a team of Sherpa in front of me. And there was um, you know, a couple other people, Eric Simonson from his own expedition. And just below the South Summit, I actually said to myself, in less than an hour, I'm gonna be on top of the world. No one had been here for a full year. There was a Hillary step on the opposite side of that knife edge ridge. That, that 60 foot vertical rock and ice pitch that I recall Sir Edmund Hillary talking about how he push, pushed himself in between the rock and the ice and he, and he made his way up. Well, to help safeguard us from falling thousands of feet should we slip, we'd use a time honored practice of fixing rope, anchoring it with snow stakes or, or ice screws across the ridge and over to the step. And then we would clip into that rope so that if we slipped, we wouldn't fall the 8,000 feet on our left hand side straight down to Camp 2, or the 10,000 feet on the right hand side down the Kangsheng face into Tibet. Well, it was an incredible feeling knowing I'd soon be at the top. And from where I stood, the world fell off all around me. The sky was clear, and this view, man. <laughs> it was even more beautiful than all the images that I'd carried in my mind. I stood behind the Sherpa as they sat, rat, as they sat rest, resting on their packs. And I changed my oxygen bottle. I was ready to go. Eric turned and asked the Sherpa to get the rope out so we could fix it across the knife edge ridge. Dead silence. A few moments later, he asked them again. And I saw two Sherpa in front of me turn to one another and then suddenly look away without saying a word. And it was then that I realized that something was wrong. Eric turned, stepped closer and said, talk to me guys, what's going on? Well, I couldn't believe what I'd just heard. We had run out of rope. <laughs> In all my planning and preparation for Everest, there was only supposed to be two things that would stop me from climbing Everest. <coughs> Excuse me. Weather or an injury. Certainly not a shortage of rope in my mind. We are 270 vertical feet below the summit, less than an hour from the top. 
and I'd climbed 99.2% of the goal. I looked up at the summit realizing all the hard effort it had taken to arrive here, the sacrifices that not only I had made, but the ones my family and others had made back home and here. I mean, I knew I could do this. I knew I could climb it. I'd done it many times before back home. And this is what I trained for. It was instinctive, and now it was real. I asked three-time summoner Nima Gumbu what he thought about going on without the safety of rope, and he simply shook his head. Nima has now gone on to climb that mountain, I believe, 19 times. I looked down at my boots, and I thought of my family, my son Zach, and of the love and the life that I have back home. I then looked back up at the summit and thought about how close that I am, that I can climb this without the rope. I was feeling so strong and so powerful and everything had come together up to this point. I explored all the options. We simply, simply couldn't run back down to camp four and retrieve more rope that we just climbed up on as it would take the lifeline away from the others who were still on their way up the mountain. And we only had enough oxygen for one, only one summit push. This was my one opportunity, right here, right now. Decision time. So you can only imagine what was going on inside my head. Do I go? Do I not go? What happens if I go and I slip and fall and die and Zach is without a father? You know, my single-mindedness, my competitive desire to achieve, to complete my goals, telling me to go on and go climb this mountain. This is what I came here for. I really didn't want to leave empty-handed after all this time and effort when I could reach out and almost touch the top. But it's that inner voice of reason, the sound of my son's voice saying, Dad, come home. That's what snaps me back to reality. It was the most difficult decision I'd ever been faced with. But all, with all these facts clearly, clearly defined, I chose to turn back. I wasn't going to summit that day. Now this was a huge setback in completing my goal, but the mountain wasn't going anywhere. In fact, it's growing about a quarter inch every year. But I now realize that the remaining percentage to reach the top was all about me. Being true to my instinct, instincts, being committed to my goal, and truly being the individual that I am, wanting to complete what I set out to do. I had to make a rational business decision up at the summit, South Summit. It was based on family, logic, percentages, and safety. Not unlike the decisions that we have to make in our everyday lives. I believe that we have to learn how to win and succeed. We have to think outside the box at times, we have to get outside of our own head at times. We have to learn that the lesser percent, in this case of the 99.2%, is just a fraction that can bring you to a halt, 270 vertical feet below the summit of your goal. So I made, a, made the decision to turn back, to come back and climb that mountain another day, to ensure that my son had a father to grow up with. That was 21 years ago. No, that was 23 years ago, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that was in 1998. I came back two years later, put together the expedition, led and organized it, had CBC television as my media conduit where I was broadcasting live daily, every day, back to Canada, the US, and the Caribbean for three straight months. It was the most televised expedition, I believe, at that time in the history of Mount Everest. Now, when we went on the summit of the mountain, May 21st, 2000, 7.05 a.m. Nepal time. So what do I take away from all this, 1998, the setback? Well, you really have to understand, when you come upon an obstacle, how do you go under, over it, around, or through it? What's your plan of attack? What are your, what's your contingency? So when I went back to lead and organize the expedition in, in 2000, I ensured that I had redundancy. I had enough oxygen and rope for four complete summit attempts. I thought at that time that I put together the best team of individuals to 
to help me in, in my endeavor to climb the mountain, to document my climbing up the mountain. And maybe that was a selfish thing to do at the time, thinking about me, but that was my goal. I mean, I was 16 years old when I put that book down and I said, one day I would climb Mount Everest. And so in 1998, I was 38 years old, so there had been a lot of time that had transpired from that. So I, I, I learned about redundancy, the importance of it. But more importantly, out of all of that, what I learned is, or reaffirmed in my mind, is that you are in control of you and the, and the situation that's around you. And I couldn't blame anyone else for, for not summoning that day because there was lack of rope. If I wanted to ensure that the rope was there, I should have brought up that goddamn rope. And so what, what it really boils down to is you are responsible for you. And if something doesn't turn out to your advantage, don't look outside yourself because those other individuals can't control you. Only you can control you. Goal setting is all about understanding clearly what it is that you're doing, how you're going to do it, and how you're going to execute upon it. So I, I just reaffirmed, I guess, in my mind how important it is for you to be in control of all the situations, regardless whether you're going with another expedition or not. I was with the British expedition. It was a commercial expedition. And when I went back in 2000, it was a fully funded expedition that I was in, the leader in the expedition, uh, coordinator on all of that. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed that little story. I'm here to, I'm, I'm alive to tell it, tell it to you. And there's a lot of people that uh, have died on Everest and other mountains around the world. Uh, and sometimes through no fault of their own and other times it, it is a fault of their own. So decision making is a critical element of everything we do in life.